In this module, I'd like to talk about the Gricean maxims of conversation. So conversations have rules, just like any other aspect of language. We've talked about how language is rule governed in many different levels in the phonology, that we have phonological rules that alter one phoneme to another, or allophonic rules, which select one allophone out of a phoneme. We have morphological rules for assembling morphemes together into words. Phrase structure rules, which assemble phrases in a given order, um, or assemble uh, the phrases together into clauses, and even can combine the clauses into sentences. The act of conversation is also rule governed. Just like the phonological rules, or morphological rules, or syntactic rules, any conversational rules are going to be specific to a particular lingua culture. Um, the way that English is spoken in Jamaica may have different phonological rules as opposed to a way that English is spoken in South Africa or in Malaysia. Um, in the same way, the conversation rules may go a little bit different in one community of practice to another community of practice. And these rules emerge naturally, just like phonology, morphology, syntax. Linguists' job is to try to describe the rules which seem to be naturally appearing in a given community of practice, um, rather than trying to cultivate them or to enforce outside rules. Um, conversation rules cover a number of issues. There's rules about who you are allowed to talk to and what kinds of situations, what you would need to do in order to address those people if you feel like you are sanctioned or you are allowed to talk to them, um, how to respond to certain kinds of conversational moves, what is the range of responses that are available to you, when to tell the truth, when to conceal part of the truth. So all of this would have to do with sort of the rules of conversation in a particular lingua culture. The cooperative principle of Paul Grice basically was trying to assemble the rules of human interaction across all cultures under these four general principles. Basically, he said, no matter what language culture we're sort of speaking within, conversation is based on a set of shared understandings. And um, what you say is intended to contribute to the purposes of the conversation. So it assumes that conversation is happening for some sort of purpose. Obviously, we're not going to follow all of these rules all of the time. Just like with syntax or phonology, people break rules for very interesting and specific purposes and for noticeable reasons. And we break these conversational rules, which he basically defined in these four forms, quality, relevance, quantity, and manner. So if we enumerate these maxims, the maxim of quantity is basically a rule which says, I, as a listener, assume that you, as my conversation partner, are going to say no more than needs to be said and no less than needs to be said. So you're telling me all of the, the exact amount of information that I need. The maximum of quality it says that I, as your listener, assume that you, my conversation partner, will never say anything that is untrue or anything for which you lack evidence. I have to assume that you're telling the truth in order for conversation to work. The maximum of relevance says that you're going to supply all of the relevant information to the topic that whatever you say is somehow relevant to the conversation and not irrelevant, and if there is something that's super relevant, it would be shared. And then the maximum of manner says you're going to say something in a way which avoids being ambiguous, which is having two possible meanings, or in a way which is obscure, meaning it's sort of clouded in darkness, that it's hard to tell exactly what you're going to say. Um, basically, it assumes that you're speaking in as clear and orderly a way as possible. Obviously, we violate these principles. Most of the time we probably follow them, or at least think we're following them, but sometimes these are violated to create an unsettling effect. If I violate the maximum of quantity, I can give you the impression of being someone who's taciturn, who refuses to speak, or someone who rambles on and on and on and doesn't realize that they've already contributed enough information that I'm giving an overabundance of conversational information. If I violate the maximum of relevance, it'll come across as a non sequitur, something that doesn't follow from what was previously said, that it's, it'll sound somehow like I'm being irrelevant, that what I'm sharing doesn't fit what we were just talking about. Um, it could also be that if you find out later that I didn't say something when I knew it and it was relevant, that would be a violation of this relevance as well. Um, quality and relevance can intertwine to give me the sense of manipulative speech, something that we might see in political speech, where I'm trying to be deliberately concealing or deliberately vague, that I actually want there to be a couple different ways that you could interpret this. Um, 
that I may be withholding information which is relevant to you, or I might employ a logical fallacy in making my argument. So using logic which isn't actually sound, something that I don't actually have accurate evidence for. An example of a violation of relevance might also be this. If someone asks in an airplane because someone had a heart attack, is there a doctor in the house? And I say, I'm a doctor, but I'm a history professor or a linguistics professor. Um, I'm not actually the kind of doctor they need. My doctorness is irrelevant to the situation. So that would be a violation of one of these principles. We can break these maxims for a number of reasons. Uh, we can break them both accidentally or really strategically to meet our ends in a conversation. There can be three basic types of maxim breaking. I could signal a violation, let you know that I'm going to violate something and kind of pre-ask for forgiveness. I could break a maxim because two different maxims clash and they make competing demands and I can't satisfy both of them at the same time. Or flouting a maxim is sort of knowingly in an, in an unsignaled manner, making a major clash, a major violation of these maxims. So a minor violation. Um, a person might come out and say, I'm going to be violating this maxim. And we've got a lot of phrases for this in all of the world's languages. I could say something like, ah, I don't know if this is relevant, but da 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 This is signaling to you that what I'm sharing may violate the maximum of relevance, but I'm asking you for your forgiveness by saying, I don't know if, or I'm not sure how to say this, but. So I may be talking too indirectly or maybe too directly, but I'm trying to ask your forgiveness in advance if I violate the maximum of manner. Um, I can't tell you that. I'm sworn to secrecy, or that would violate a trust. So I'm signaling to you outright, hey, I'm going to withhold some relevant information. I ask your forgiveness by just saying I'm not at liberty to divulge that information. Or I might say something about the quality. I'm going to signal the maximum of quality. Ah, this is just the word on the street, or I heard a rumor. I can't vouch for this information. You know, they say that, da, da, da. These are all signals that the information I'm sharing may be a low quality and I'm trying to ask your forgiveness um, in advance for that violation. A maxim clash would be when there's two competing maxims. So let's say that Carson is driving John to Meredith's house. If Carson says, where does Meredith live? And John says, Columbia, assuming that they're in the city of Columbia, that might be true, so it doesn't violate the maxim of quality, but it's actually withholding the most relevant information. If they're in the city, probably what they were asking was something more specific. On a much smaller scale, what neighborhood does she live in? What street does she live in? Maybe what house number does she live in? So by saying this, like I'm, vi I'm not violating the maxim of quality, but I'm probably violating here the maxim of kind of quantity. I'm not giving you enough information, detailed enough information or relevance, the, the fact that the city she lives in isn't as relevant as maybe the information about the neighborhood. If John didn't know where Meredith lives, he's trying to give as detailed information as he can without lying. Um, and so he's trying to preserve the maximum of quality by not lying or not saying something he's not sure of, even though that's going to violate the maximum of quantity or the maximum of relevance that the, the information he's supplying is not enough. Um, so there's a clash between the demands for quality, don't say something that you don't know for sure, and quantity, say as much as you need to say in this situation. Flouting a maxim is a more serious thing. Um, this would be a more major violation of a maxim. Um, when we do this, when we flout a maxim intentionally, we often do it in order to create what we call a conversational implicature. Um, that's to say that by clearly and obviously violating a maxim, I'm implying something that I don't want to outright say. It could be that it's face-threatening to say it, it could be that it's impolite to say this thing, so to communicate that information, I choose instead to flout one of these maxims. Um, an implicature, if you've never heard this word before, is basically just a conclusion that you can come to based on language use and based on speakers pre-existing knowledge about the actors or about the way that the world works rather than a conclusion that's based on what is directly said. So an implicature would be something that my listener is kind of reading between the lines of what I say. That I'm not saying something outright, but they're able to tell I probably mean something that I'm not saying based on the limited evidence that I am giving. Basically, I mean, an implicature of well, there was a passing army, but I couldn't see the army because there was a hill in the way. 
but I saw a cloud of dust rising up. I could infer the presence of this passing army. And that's basically kind of like by violating one of these maxims, that's kind of like the cloud of dust, which lets you infer, okay, I bet something is true here that this person doesn't want to come out and say outright. And this can be actually very useful, very strategic in conversation in terms of not taking the blame or it's a way that I'm not really held accountable for what I say. Um, let's look at some examples where flouting a maxim could create a conversational implicature. Say person A says, is he cute? And person B says, he has a really great personality. Well, this is not relevant, right, this answer. It doesn't answer the question of if he's cute, and I wasn't actually asking about his personality, but I supply this. So it's a violation of relevance for sure. I'm not giving you relevant information, and it seems like I'm giving you irrelevant information. But you're going to read between the lines, and probably you're going to infer there's going to be this implicature that actually he is not cute, but he has other redeeming qualities. So I, person B doesn't want to come out and say that he's not cute. Um, and by saying he's a great personality, I'm kind of leaving that up to person A to infer the answer to their question when I don't want to say it directly. Uh, so this violates the maxim of relevance. If person A says, a lot of people are depending on you, person B says, thanks, that really takes the pressure off. But actually, person A was putting pressure on them. So person B is saying something which is not true. It's a lie. Um, and they're kind of leaving, why would you say something that's obviously not true based on the context? Well, this is what we call sarcasm, right? That person B is sort of leaving it up to person A to kind of interpret what person B said as like, hey, don't put any pressure on me, or hey, that was rude or that was unhelpful to say this to me. But person B not saying that directly, but instead saying that indirectly, um, they're sort of creating this implicature, something that wasn't quite said because of a violation of the maxim here. Because it's obviously true, or a person A obviously knows that what person B says is untrue, they're going to imply that, hey, that wasn't a helpful thing to share with me. And this is a, a violation of the maxim of quality. Person B is saying something which is obviously untrue for which they lack evidence. Person A says, hey, tell them what happened. If person B said, Alex saw an object or entity strongly resembling a giant bug, that doesn't match the way that language was being used by person A. Person A is using this informal, clear thing. They probably would be expecting person B to say something like, well, Alex saw this huge insect. It was crazy. But by speaking in this kind of strange way, this more scientific way, a way which is a little bit vague, um, Alex saw an object or entity strongly resembling a giant bug, that would put everyone kind of scratching their heads. Like, why are you answering in this unexpected way? It's a violation of manner, that you're not speaking in the way which is appropriate or the manner which is appropriate. In fact, you're being very ambiguous. You're being very unclear. Uh, the implicature might be something like that it could be that they don't want to go beyond that for which they have absolute evidence. So it could be a kind of a maxim clash between quality and manner here. This is evidence that person B is reluctant to make too strong of a claim about what Alex saw. Any of these four maxims you could flout, which would end up in an implicature. Uh, I'd like a cup of coffee. Joe's is around the corner. I never outright said that Joe's is a place where you could buy coffee. But because I'm saying something which appears to be irrelevant, you're going to try to assume it must be relevant somehow. So the implicature which arises out of that flouting is that Joe's must be a place that I could buy coffee, that Joe's is the name of a coffee shop, even though I didn't actually outright say that. Have you finished all your homework? I finished my history homework. Um, if I answer it that way, um, I'm withholding information. I'm not sharing everything that I know, everything that I know to be true. The implicature here is that I've only finished a small portion of my homework and that a lot of it is unfinished. Um, but person B doesn't want to come right out and say no. They want to emphasize what they have done and not what they haven't done in hopes that maybe person A would rate them more highly. So the implicature is that I haven't done a lot of my other homework. I've only done that subset, which was history homework. Robin took the medication and had an allergic reaction. This may not strike you as very strange, but it's because we try really hard to make this sentence make sense. We would assume the implicature that arises out of this flouting would be that 
Robin's taking the medication caused an allergic reaction in Robin. But and is actually ambiguous here. And has tons of different meanings. Um, it could be that these are completely unrelated events. Um, but because of and has so many different things, it can mean unrelated, simultaneous, unrelated, non-simultaneous, uh, related, simultaneous, unrelated, non-simultaneous events. You're going to assume the clearest thing would be that this is trying to do a cause and effect type relationship. So and communicates that cause and effect here. Robin had an allergic reaction and took the medication. Again, I'm just switching the order. Technically, if and were only a conjunction with no other force, the truth value of this sentence would be exactly the same as the truth value of this sentence. But now I'm going to imply a different cause and effect. I'm going to imply that the medication was taken to alleviate the allergic reaction that Robin had, rather than that the medication caused the allergic reaction. Logically, it could be true that these things happened, this one happened before that one, or they happened at the same time. Um, but you're going to assume that this is the one that went first and that it caused the second one. Uh, this is not the way that people normally talk, right? This is a weird violation of manner here. Um, the implicature is that I'm trying to be probably very formal or too formal. You're going to make some sort of assumptions about the kind of setting that we're in or the kind of relationship that we're in in order for this manner to match. If I was to do this in a normal classroom, this would be far too formal for the kind of discourse that we have in our classes. Um, sarcasm is always a violation of the maxim of quality, but people do it a lot. If someone asked, Tehran's in Turkey, right? And then someone said, yes, and London's in Armenia. Um, that's actually what B means to say is that, no, you're wrong. But they're being sarcastic here. They're saying something which is obviously untrue, hoping to signal to person A that their assertion that they're testing with a yes or no particle right at the end is also false. So the implicature would be, no, Tehran is not in Turkey, but that's not what's said at all. That's, it's left to be implied based on this obvious and grievous flouting of the maxim of quality. Here's an interesting piece of data. Here there's a woman who is talking, a Hungarian-American woman. She's living in Hungary, and she's trying to make a claim about the Hungarians. So she's the heart of the claim that she's trying to make here is that they're a racist culture. A racist culture is sort of the main idea that she is trying to convey in line 30. Um, but we see that there's a lot going on kind of before and after this statement racist culture. Right, and like Beverly was saying, I don't know if you picked up on it, but they are, they're kind of a racist culture. I mean, I don't know if it's more racist, but they're very nationalistic. So this is a lot of turns here. We can see in Jeffersonian notation that there's some maxims which are being flouted. I mean, this is actually not very good manner. Um, I don't know if you put on, but they are their kind of racist culture. I mean, I don't know if. So the fact that I'm repeating all of these things, like I'm adding kind of all of this fluff or sort of what you could think of it as layers of padding. I don't know. They are their kind of. It's basically trying, it's a violation of the maxim of manner, which signals something. It probably signals, 
I don't want to be very direct about calling them a racist culture. Um, the fact that they're, she's saying kind of a racist culture, um, she's asserting this to Beverly and not just herself. Here she's re-qualifying it or rephrasing it. I don't know if it's more racist, but they're very nationalistic. She's trying to come up with a better word. It's kind of a signal that she may be violating the maximum of quality here that she's saying something which she doesn't 100% agree with or isn't 100% sure of. So she's signaling some violations of the maximum of quality as well. And she's probably going to all of this work to kind of hedge or to pad this claim. She's putting it in someone else's mouth as well as hers. She's appealing to the speaker for their own interpretation or to see if they agree with her. She's saying, I don't know. And then she's repeating, they are there. She's using a hedging phrase, kind of. Um, I mean is a signal like I'm about to rephrase it. I don't know, so signaling unsureness. If it's more racist, the use of more here. I, she could have said, I don't know if it's racist, but they're very nationalistic. I don't know if it's more racist but they're very nationalistic. So rephrasing it, backtracking from the claim she made to a less strong claim. All of these are different conversational strategies that she's trying to use to back off on a potential face threat to the Hungarians. Which kind of face is being threatened? Here it's Hungarians' positive face. Hungarians are acting in her mind in a way which is not normal, is not well socialized, is not well behaved. They're doing something which is out of the ordinary, which would be a threat to their positive face.